My name is Rose Amador LeBeau. I am President and CEO of the Center for Training and Career, CTC. Our mission is to help people through employment and education become self-sufficient. We have a day worker center. We have educational programs so people can get their GEDs. We serve a variety of people, people who've just become unemployed, people who have never worked. We work with homeless people. We work with people who have just gotten out of prison and have to re-enter the workforce. So we're full service. Now we have our own facility, and so it enables us to expand programs in response to the needs of the community. I think it's seeing people make the change, become successful, uh, make that transition, and actually having an impact on people's lives, a positive impact. To see these success stories is what it's all about. Welcome to Native Voice TV. I'm Siwapili Rose Amador. And I'm Sundas Martinez, and together we are Native Voice TV. We are the indigenous people. Yes, we are. Well, we have a very special guest for you today. Yes, we do. I'd like to introduce to you Ron Pinkham. Welcome, Ron. Oh, thank you. Ron is of the Nez Perce Nation, and Ron is a counselor, a youth counselor, mental health counselor, and you've worked with many indigenous people, and in, you worked on reservations, you've worked with a lot of tribes. Yeah. And I've also heard people refer to you as a medicine man. So you have quite a bit of experience and wealth of knowledge that you bring to our people. Oh yeah. I wanna add a comment here. I just wanna acknowledge the, the shooting that we had at the Red Lake Indian Reservation and our heart, yeah, big tragedy. Our hearts go out and our condolences go out to the family of Minnesota. And I want to ask you, Ron, how, as indigenous people and elders and and you know tribal leaders or community leaders, how can we address this and help our youth and avoid something and, and like avoid this? And avoid a, a big think. massacre like this, a big problem like this. Since I was working with uh, youth on the Nez Perce, Yakima, and uh, Marm Springs Reservation, I've seen a lot of young people who are different, violent, and whatever. It appears that the ones who uh, are in that way, it is what our elders say that the, they have not given to the young people a spiritual talk a way of walking in the path of life. And when they are not into that, and not following the spiritual path, going to the ceremonies, attending them, or even being part of it, uh, I've been to many ceremonies where the elder would sit there with just little children, mm -hmm. and he'd teach them songs, teach them to hold a drum, teach them to speak the language, now I see them now, they're about 30 years old and they're fine. Mm -hmm. But those youngsters or young people who are not following that path or no elders teaching them, they're the ones that are going wayward and going into drugs, alcohol, and whatever. And they seem to do what they please. The reservation police and other people become very concerned about that. And the problem that I used to ask these young people, how come you're not following this path like your cousin is, mm -hmm. who is going to the ceremonies and such? Because my parents don't do that. They drink, they do whatever, mm -hmm. and the parents get upset that their children are doing that. And I said, well, I tell the parents, the children are following your path, mm -hmm. whatever you're doing. 
If a child is going to the longhouse and going to ma many ceremonies and such, they're following their parents' path. And the grandparents are the ones who give a teaching to the children. They're the ones that sit them down, just like the old man did with his grandchildren. He'd sit them in a row and he'd teach and he'd sing to them and tell them the meaning of every song until they begin to learn the songs. They may, as young teenagers do, drink and do whatever, but they fall back if they go too far and figure out that this is not the way to go. They fall back to the elders and what they have been taught when they were a youth. Always to respect each other, to love one another, to honor each other. That's now being that this was on a reservation, um, is what's, where's the disconnect because you figure that they're surrounded by other you know native people all the time now is it that a lot of the parents don't show the children you know the spirituality or they wait for the grandparents to do it when i was on these reservations working as a counselor in the high school system it appeared that a lot of people gave up on them because they're too old. No one's too old to learn the spiritual path of the ceremonies and such. No one is. And uh, I used to attend a lot of funerals when these young people would die, overdose and whatever. Is there a high percentage of suicidal or suicide rates on the yeah, reservation? Yeah, that too. And one reservation, uh, the Warm Springs Reservation, start holding ceremonies just for that and start bringing them in. When we had it on our reservation, uh, this one lady became very concerned because my cousin committed suicide in her home. So she had people come to her home from another reservation and brought all those children, young people. He was 16 when he did it. Mm -hmm. And they made a suicide pact and brought them all into the ceremony and told him what life is. Yes, it can be hurtful and painful, but when you learn to teach a child to pray, to become involved, because the ceremony brings a family atmosphere to these young people. When they're out there off by themselves doing whatever, they feel no family. The ceremonies in itself are to bring people together as family. That's what the ceremonies are for. When you have memorials and name givings, you want the whole family to That's be right. with you. To be involved. To so, be all there. So a lot of these situations aren't happening in certain reservations or just... Yeah, they're not. And uh, these people become somewhat... Disconnected or something. Yeah, disconnected to it all. And not realizing that a few blocks over or in a community center or in a person's home that ceremonies are taking place. They have no knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised that our elders are not going out looking for them. And mm -hmm. then when I asked some young people who are this way, who weren't connected, how come you don't go? We feel odd. We feel strange. I said, well, you'll, be, you'll feel welcome when you do attend these ceremonies and you'll feel that you're not alone, you're not disconnected, and whatever. Uh, Another problem I always used to see too is our tribal councils or governing bodies need to really be involved as well mm -hmm. because they can initiate programs just designed for the youth who are in that way. We had a conversation earlier and you mentioned something about the elder match with the youth. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. That seemed like a very interesting and great yeah, what concept. What happened uh, when they would find a young person who was being totally violent and really uh, hitting people the whole bit and drinking and using drugs and having being arrested by the tribal police often, what the tribe did was they forced that child not to go to jail but to end up going to the, where the senior citizens lived and have that person live with that elder. That's good. They had to live with them for at least a month. The elder was, how you say, used tough love on that child and every day they had to go sweat with the other students 
or young people who were also in this, where the old senior citizens lived, mm -hmm. where the elders lived. And every day, every evening, they had to go sweat. And it was run by some other uh, people who had the same problems as well and knew what they were talking about and taught the young people when they were in sweat to talk their feelings. What, did it, what is it that's troubling you? To give them the freedom to just let it go and talk it out. Mm -hmm. And see the sweat as a very sacred ceremony and that when you are doing this, you're releasing the feelings that hurt you and give you pain. And then teaching the young person to pray. Now, let me ask you a question now. Do you think that it's all part of not having classes where they're learning their culture or their way of life, you know, because a lot of the schools that we go to, we learn, um, you know, European history and we never learn our history. So we never have that established that sense of pride as being a child or as being indigenous or anything like that. Do you think that maybe like tribal schools or some kind of charter schools can counter react that and put a sense of pride into our children? Yeah, I worked at the uh, Nespers Tribal School <coughs> and the Yakima Tribal School and much of their uh, and even in Warm Springs, what they did in Warm Springs was they brought in, the tribe paid for certain people to come in and teach them skills. Let's say how to build a house, be a plumber, be electrician. Uh, the Warm Springs Reservation is virtually 90% forest, so they brought in somebody to teach forestry. Excellent. And to, so the, I was the counselor and, and tried to recruit kids into these programs. And then on the reservation itself, we did things with parenting skills to teach parents how to deal with these kids because they sit there, I can't talk to my kid. Mm -hmm. You know, all they do is swear and use four letter words or they're drunk or high on something. So we had to bring the groups together to face each other and start talking to each other. Teach young people and the parents how to talk, to communicate what's going on with their kid. Mm -hmm in school and in the community. Uh, the matching well with an elder, really, it changed some kids like that. And Seems the like sweats. a great concept. So and we need to get the elders involved and yeah. get them teaching, and we also need to get the youth to understand and respect the elders Yeah, well. and then uh, in the uh, elementary school, since the elementary school was on the reservation itself, taught the language mm, to the young great. people. The Yakima Tribal School taught Yakima language and the Nespers Tribal School taught Nespers language and try to get them to reconnect to mm -hmm. the culture, to the history of our own people, and many of the things that our tribal council is fighting for, certain kinds of rights, mm -hmm. such as fishing rights and such. And they became involved so that by the time they were 18 years of age, they became, became involved in the politics of the tribe, mm -hmm. but in a different route. And uh, other elders, even on, uh, well, the Warm Springs, we used to bring the elders into the public school. Mm, even though the tribe was 14 miles away, never the twain shall meet. Uh, and it w this was the only way. Yeah. So we That's brought the great. elders in and they taught all the classes, storytelling, uh -huh. history, uh, the certain ceremonies that they can release to non-Indian mm -hmm. people, what they can tell about them even show uh, in the area, there is this mountain, this is what this mountain's called in our language, and this is the story behind that mount or certain things within the physical geography of the mm -hmm. reservation area or the town of Madras, Oregon. The elders would come and do that. We'd have people come in to teach all students how to do silversmithing, beadworking, how to cook the traditional foods, all students had to learn that. And it was a way of getting the student, the Indian one, to say, hey, this is what our people do. Right, it seems like getting back to the ways really yeah, helps and, the kids. And then teaching the non-Indian people to be respectful of what's going on mm -hmm. on I, the reservation. I know if you work on little intricate stuff, such as beading or, or silver or smith or something like that, you also get, you learn patience. You learn yeah. self-patience. Self 
and you learn to, to understand certain things and then that you could put that in life, project that in life with your mom or your, your grandfather or your, uh -huh. your wife when you get married that you, you can yeah, put that I, in your life. So, yeah. Before I ask you a little bit about your, your background <coughs> and your tribe, um, I know that the people on the, the Red Lake, Lake Reservation really need our help and there's, we have an address where you can send donations and offer whatever assistance you can and we'll be showing that up on the screen. There it is right there if you want to send uh, donations to the Red Lake Memorial Fund in uh, Minnesota. Yeah, it's a lot of... Uh... Yeah, it's sad that that occurred there and I know that uh, there are some young people who are totally alone mm -hmm. and yeah. don't know anything that's going on and get into other things. Uh, sometimes people are amazed that Indian children or youth on a reservation are into hip hop and this, that, and the mm -hmm. other, and whatever they are, mm -hmm. and speak a whole language that is of themselves. I had to learn that in order to communicate some yeah. things with them. And in the tribal schools, with a lot of the courses and literature was dealing with people, our native people who do write poetry, stories, even they went to conferences and met like Sherman Alexi. We had, uh, there is a Northwest Indian Youth Conference that is held every year that I started. Mm -hmm. Now it's about 27, 28 years now. That was set up to bring the students together, find out what's going on between each other on their reservations, what problems are going on, how did they solve it, and one third of it had to do with sharing culture of the reservation that this conference is at. The other one is sharing what's happening in the high school, mm -hmm. um, if they had an Indian club or didn't. And the other the third was, where do we go from here? College, vocational school, whatever. And had many recruiters come in and, and then had people who were actually the role models mm -hmm. of these industries and wherever they work the beginning you could see him. Oh, he works for Lockheed, he works for Boeing, he works for this, that. But they had a future, something to look forward yeah, to. Yeah, because on the reservation, uh, even my own, uh, and even on the Long Springs when I worked there in the Yakima, a lot of students don't care to graduate. Mm -hmm. They say, what's the use? Yeah. yeah, what for? There's what no for? jobs, there's nothing. There's no there. jobs. Well, tell there's us nothing. about your tribe. My tribe, uh, there's 3,300 of us, uh, I think as of last September. We're located where Washington, Oregon, and Idaho meet. And there are two other sections of our tribe, one in, uh, on the Colville Reservation where Chief Joseph and his group ended up. Now are and you related to Chief Joseph? Yeah. You are? Uh, his father was Old Chief Joseph, and his name was Olamot Kin. Um, my grandmother called him Tuitakis. Uh, Tuitakis means the older one and she is descendant of the oldest daughter of old Chief Joseph and then young Chief Joseph of the 1877 war is her younger brother and so he, she, he, her uh, great-great-grandmother married Black Eagle so my grandmother's name was Annette Black Eagle. Hi. Winnetowant Mai, I know all these names. <laughs> and so then come down the line. And then I'm also a descendant of Chief Looking Glass, who helped with the treaties to ensure that we had fishing rights, uh -huh. the right to gather roots, mm -hmm. and berries, and to deal with that issue, which is, became a very big issue. And Chief Looking Glass was the one who helped pull the tribes together. Now this picture here is of my great-grandfather who was in the 1877 war and I think he was about 14 years of age and his name is Ilutsilakatset. That means uh, one who is standing on a high point signaling. And at 14 he was in the war and at near Wisdom, Montana, on the border of Montana and Idaho, north of Pocatello was the Battle of Little Big Hole and that's where he was and him and his friend then took off from that place and went back to Lapway 
he had braids and everything as a young kid and he was captured and it was a bounty on everyone who was in the war. So he ended up in the stockade in Lapway, then ended up going to Oklahoma and he was married there when he was a young boy at 16 because the older ones who were in their 30s and 40s were having children, their children died. So the tribe became very concerned, we're dying out, and we're going to die in Oklahoma and not at home. So they asked all these young kids to marry one another and have children, and their children didn't die. And so then he returned back to the Nez Perce Reservation. So when all the uh, Nez Perce from Oklahoma went back, they divided them up. If you want to go off to the Colville Reservation, Nespelum, Washington, and continue being and following the tradition, you go there. If you don't care to, one way or the other, and want to be, go ahead and be Christian, you go to Lapway. And that's mm -hmm. where we, they ended up. And he went to, to Lapway. Uh -huh. But now because the Christian element was so strong, he ended up going to the Yakima Reservation and marrying there. Before they uh, throw us off the show. Yeah, here. we're kind of running out of time. <laughs> I want to <laughs> find out what these are all about. Oh, so okay. These us. are two videos. One I did in 1999 and this one I think in 2003. This is with the Denver March powwow. This is a documentary oh. about how the powwow was run and how it works. And this one was on the singers, Heartbeat of Nations, and this and just Denver March powwow. Uh, my friend did this and his name was Brian Malone and I, if I remember right, uh, it's www.malonetv.com, I think. I'm not sure. Okay. I'll, I'll have to look it up. That's a great. But they gave these it, we have a minute, so let's. Yeah. Mm. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> We're running really long here. Okay. <coughs> and is there anything else you'd like to oh. show us here? Oh, I, you asked me about some bringing something along. This is a root right here. It's called Kaus Kaus. Those people who sing at the war dances and such are singing, period. It grows in our area, and you take that, cut a little slice of it off, put it in your mouth, and and if you have a bad cough too, it'll stop that. You have to there pass it along so I don't keep coughing. <laughs> yeah, and then you let it soak down into the mouth, and then you, you can resume singing. Wow! Well, thank you for sharing that. that. Wow! Instead well, of doing. Th and thank you for coming on. I think we're going to have to have you on again because you just have so much information and. I, I wish we could make two shows out of this. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll probably bring you back again. Yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. But you know, there's uh, we lost a, um, a Mashika, I want to say elder. Yes, who that is correct. Has, um, really paved the way for Chicano Chicano music. He used to be in the big band era, the Zoot Suit era. And uh, he was known as the father, grandfather of Chicano music. Actually, the godfather. Godfather, <laughs> grandfather, godfather. <laughs> they're all very equally important. And his name, Lalo Guerrero. And we want to show you a little clip of him with a lot of the community uh, members. And he was just, he was a very fun person. He wrote a lot of song parodies. And one of the song parodies he wrote is, is with this little clip. But it also, it talks about how we're not represented on television yeah, and you shouldn't always, support products that don't show our image in uh, he always, yeah he always had a political twist on to and it and he he did and he songs. died at the age of 88 he lived a wonderful life he was a wonderful person so let's take a, take a look at this clip of Lalo Guerrero I think that I shall never see any Chicanos on TV. It seems as though we don't exist, and we're not ever even missed. And yet we buy and buy their wares, but no Chicanos. Anywhere We need more color on TV Cause black and white is all you see I'd like to see a shade of brown In real life we're all around 
All types of TV shows abound But no Chicanos can be found There are Chicanos in real life Doctors, lawyers, husbands, wives But all they show us on TV Are really good aliens as they flee Or some poor cholo that they bust Flat on his face, he's eating dust Script writers never write for us I think it's time we made a fuss Casting directors never call They never think of us at all Edward James Olmos and Montalban That's all we've got Son of a gun Don't buy the product if you see No Chicanos on TV Huggies has his three babies White and black and Japanese Chicano babies also pee But they don't show them on TV. Oh, what a nice video. Wow. I also like to thank our sponsor, El Observador, and also like to thank uh, Ron Pinkman. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Pinkham. 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 Pinkham.